Welcome to the public lecture for the Curating Across Disciplines class. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, uh, this class has been going on uh, since the beginning of the semester, and it has three principal components, or four principal components. One is we have a uh, lecture that students attend in this room uh, every Monday. On Wednesdays, we have public lectures uh, and to which we invite outside speakers and also the public. Um, and then we have uh, sectional meetings led by our brilliant and talented GSIs, um, who, one of whom has something to say, yes. Um, and, uh, and then we also, um, one of the great things about the, the class is that it, it, we provide students with access to programming that's happening on campus, whether it's the performing arts or the visual arts. So the students have been required to attend a number of different uh, programs on campus. So it's kind of a, I think it's a, a rich class, um, and, and one of the reasons is, well, why don't, Pei, uh, Pei Ting has an announcement she'd like to make, so why don't, you, why don't you do this first? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, students. I just wanted to remind you that this week we're meeting in section at the Hearst Museum, which is located near the intersection of Bancroft and Telegraph, uh, uh, college, excuse me, College and Bancroft, right? Um, across from the law school and also across from Cafe Strata. So sections this week will be at the Hearst Museum. Sure. Um, for those of you who don't know, the Hearst Museum is one of the great anthropology collections in the world, um, most of which isn't on view, but you'll get a chance to see uh, the exhibition that they've just done. Um, so I was going to say that one of the reasons this, this program has been uh, so rich is that we've had access to some uh, amazing outside speakers and we have one of them with us today. Theo Watson is the um, lead person. She, uh, he, he and his wife, Emily Gobiel, uh, run a uh, design firm, um, interactive design firm uh, called uh, Design.io. They had been in Cambridge uh, in for most of the time I've worked with them, uh, and now they've just moved to Petaluma just in time for the fires. Um, so they had a smoky beginning, but hopefully things will, will be easier from, from here on out. Um, I know Theo uh, from work we did at my previous uh, job, which is at the New York Hall of Science, um, where we worked on a large-scale interactive um, exhibition together, which you'll be talking about, and we'll be talking about together. And in, before that, he had been um, well known in the interactive design community as the creator of a software framework, I guess, called Open Frameworks, um, which uh, he can tell you about better than I can. Uh, and, um, and as kind of a masterful use of tech, uh, user of technology um, in a broad range of contexts, the uh, one of the early things I saw was a, um, I don't think you'll be talking about this all, it was a um, graffiti artist uh, or who was um, immobile um, because of a disability and they created a system where he could uh, create his tags and, and is that right that they were projected onto, projected onto the side of a building uh, so he got to do graffiti tagging from, from, his, uh, from, from his immobile situation. So I, was, I thought that was kind of an amazing uh, use of technology for public good. Um, and he has, he solved some just incredibly thorny problems that we had uh, at, for this exhibition. So the bulk of this talk will be um, him describing the work in the exhibition. I will be doing, uh, I'll stay up here and doing a little bit of back and forth with him. Um, and th that will go for about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, depending on how much back and forth there is. And then um, we'll really try to open up into a more participatory dialogue. We'll go to sort of Charlie Rose style here, um, but the intent would be for anybody who has questions to ask them then. So I think the smartest way to f do this is if while he's talking, while we're both standing up here, is to sort of think about the questions you have and make notes of them. And then once we go over to the, uh, to sit down, we can have it a, a more common discussion. So um, without any more introduction, um, I'm, I'm pleased that Theo is able to join us. Thanks. <coughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Theo from Design.io, Theo Watson. Um, at Design.io, we make 
um, interactive installations, uh, new tools, experimental tools for data visualization and explore new forms of storytelling. Um, this is the kind of core team of us, um, Emily, myself, Nick and Anna. Um, we used to be based in Cambridge and this was our office up until about a month ago and now we're out in Petaluma which is absolutely beautiful uh, when it's not on fire or when there aren't fires burning all around um, and it's about an hour north of here um, and we've just literally been getting settled in the last couple of weeks uh, so the timing is great to be able to come down here and talk to you all. Um, I'm going to show you kind of really the first project that sort of in a way started off Design.io as a firm. Uh, my wife Emily and I were working separately doing uh, independent kind of projects and um, we were asked by a children's festival in the Netherlands to come up with an installation for kids together. And so we were thinking about the things that we love to do as children and I used to spend time like creating dams and playing with water and uh, according to Emily she spent most of her time climbing trees. So we were trying to think of an idea that would combine these two things together into an installation. And we came up with this idea called Funky Forest, where you can make a gesture against a projection, like the shape of a tree that you want to make, and a tree grows up in front of you that takes the shape from your arms. Um, and then um, the forest is sort of nurtured by water flowing from a waterfall that you direct with these physical logs uh, across the floor to the trees to keep them alive. I'll just show you a little video of, of Funky Forest. Oops, sorry. there really wasn't any objective for the children in this experience. It wasn't a win-lose state. Um, it was very much just a, you know, a couple of systems that kind of came together to support each other. Um, and so really children were kind of free to do what they want with the installation and kind of pursue their own objectives. And that sort of speaks to this idea of open play, which we really try and embody in our work, which is sort of essentially allowing children to create their own objectives and their own, own, their own narratives within a system where there are kind of inherent connections that they can discover. Um, so in this example, the boy and his grandfather have like routed the logs perfectly to keep all the trees alive. Um, and you know, you see one gets bumped and he adjusts it so that it, you know, the trees stay healthy. But then he decides that he wants to see what happens when they get no water. And so he puts the logs in front of the trees and you can see the trees starting to wither away. And this is, you know, from our perspective, from an open play perspective, this is just as valid uh, kind of interaction as trying to keep the forest healthy. And in this case, the two children discover that the creatures are actually afraid of you. And if you try and touch them, they run away. And so for the next half an hour, all they did was just try and catch the creatures. So I think I was giving this very same presentation to Eric at Nisai and, and the rest of his uh, team there um, and you know, talking about how originally with Funky Forest we'd actually wanted to create several Funky Forests that were somehow all connected together, but that was a far too big and ambitious idea uh, to realize. So this may be a good moment to chime in. <laughs> uh, we had a problem uh, to solve um, or an opportunity to address. Um, we had this, thank you, we had this amazing space, which is a landmark space. Um, I w you can see for scale uh, what, a, what the human size is there. It's 80 feet tall. It's clad in cobalt uh, glass called Val de Vere. It comes from the World's Fair. Anybody who was in New York in 1964, not many of you, um, uh, will remember this. I do. I have a sense memory of it. Um, and uh, I won't, it was, it's kind of an amazingly 
moving space. It, it, you feel like you're sort of immersed in outer space, uh, and the curving walls are dramatic. Um, and it was all being restored, and we, we needed to, we wanted to open it with something that was really commensurate with the beauty of the space, and it had, and we had some ideas about what we might try to do. Uh, in order to address this idea, we had a series of, uh, are you all of you familiar with the term charrette? We invite designers in to uh, brainstorm. We had a series of charrettes um, where we came up with everything from a, a circus that would take advantage of the height to bubbles and balloons. Um, it was kind of blue sky. Um, and then we had, we, we settled on a theme for this. We wanted it to be about data. And so, uh, because we thought that was an important topic, and also the place is, is kind of lends itself to that. Um, and we had no idea how to do that. So we had another charrette of people who were data visualization people. And one of them said, oh, have you ever seen Funky Forest? Um, this was after like three days of banging our head against the wall. And we said, no. He said, oh, I have a video here on YouTube. And that's what, what you saw is what we just uh, showed you. And um, so that's that, that brings us to what, what Theo was just talking about. Um, so there was this kind of really funny moment when we, when we said we needed a bigger space. And actually, Eric led Emily and I into this room. And we were just like, oh, <laughs> OK. You know, and then we started being like, OK, there's a waterfall there. You know, we could you know, put some things there. But I think very wisely, um, Eric and the team at NICE kind of suggested doing this as a sort of back and forth you know, kind of a series of baby steps to start off with. And so we were kind of artists in residence at the New York Hall of Science for five months. Um, and we were doing all sorts of strange stuff, sometimes without their knowledge, um, you know, checking colors, coming up with ways of interaction that we might want to look at, like revealing what's hidden within kind of natural forms. Um, we even started thinking about kind of resource trading with a kind of building a touchscreen prototype. Um, and then we started to kind of hone in on this idea of kind of, you know, separate systems that are all connected together, like, you know, the town that's connected to the farm, that's connected uh, to the water supply. Actually, so there's a moment here that's worth, uh, so the students who have been in the class have heard me talk about some of the difficulties in ex exhibiting science now, is that a lot of science is abstract or hard to see. It's, it's either too big, too small, too fast, too slow, or in this case, kind of abstract. Um, so we had been talking about data, and data, when we, one of the things we do is we ask the public when we have an idea, what do they think of this idea? And the response we got was, that really sounds incredibly boring. Um, so um, we decided we better sort of wrap, if we're going to talk about data, it has to be data about something. And that's the moment at which we decided that the, the most compelling and important topic we could address in terms of data visualization is climate science. So this is kind of where the direction that we started going with, with Theo, rather than talking about just data visualization, which is what I mentioned earlier, we're actually now talking about resource use and, uh, and climate science. So kind of from this sketch, early sketch, we started thinking about, okay, like what would an interactive farm experience be like? Um, we got really obsessed with this fruit ninja gesture, which was like, you know, using like a chopping gesture to, to cut stuff down. Um, so we made this prototype uh, in a couple of weeks uh, where you could use kind of your arms to put water down and grow corn. And then um, once the corn was ready to be harvested, you could kind of uh, chop it as with a kind of uh, a fruit ninja gesture. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was, it, there's like a kind of game where you cut fruit with your finger, and so I hope it, I shouldn't probably publicly admit to that, uh, <laughs> just in case, but, um, and you know, this was just like something we were testing, and it, you know, it was kind of like we we're l letting people control how much they're growing, and, um, and so from that, we, we went on to another prototype uh, with Eric and the team where we were.
with the kind of feedback from that decision. Um, and so we can kind of bend the rules in order to make the point and to allow children to actually see those connections. One of the other challenges of, of um, talking about climate science, it, I think we touched on this in the last class, it's just really disempowering. It feels like there's nothing you can do about it. So, and, and we always got that feedback from people who have done other educational programs. I've, and you've seen the, the uh, first Al Gore movie, you know, one of the reasons that it was so problematic is that it just presented this overwhelming problem and didn't give you any sense of you know what you could actually do. So one of our goals here, particularly working with the kids, and by the way, we should mention that the audience for this always was young people, um, typically like sort of five to 12, um, was to try to create a situation where there was some satisfaction that you could, you could um, gain uh, in ways that Theo was about to tell you about. So you know, th from a design uh, kind of perspective, once we sort of kind of honed in on the idea, the approach, the concept, we went through this period of sort of experimentation where we're coming up with the look and feel of the landscape, the look and feel of the plants and creatures. These were some early plant designs. Um, we had like 10 sheets like this, and I think only like maybe 1% of all the plants we designed actually made it into the final thing. Um, Eric now works as the director of uh, the botanical gardens here, and so I feel like this is becoming <laughs> is much more familiar to him now. <laughs> uh, the, the Titan Arum looks like some of these, you know, the, the uh, corpse flower. Um, and then, you know, just exploring different sort of aesthetics. This is when we were going a little bit too surreal and trippy, I think. I think it was a little neon. Um, we did a lot of play testing, um, testing sort of at different scales. We were trying to see what multiple environments connected to a single water system would look like. So we were using foam core to prototype. Um, we also rented out space that would be, you know, as close as we could get to the New York Hall of Science uh, scale. And then, you know, testing projections at the same scale where Emily is looking at, like, what type of colors work projected, what type of textures, how do you hide the pixelation effect of the projector. Um, also, even just testing the perspectives that we're looking at, like, does this perspective actually work for someone who's like five to six years old? Um, so there's a lot of kind of stuff that go behind the scenes that goes into the decisions that we make and the kind of design approach that we take. Um, and then we also spend a lot of time on our hands and knees with our elbows tucked in, trying to pretend to be four or five year olds, uh, you know, from a computer track computer vision tracking standpoint. Um, and you know, part of this process was. Uh, you know, built into this was using the space at the Hall of Science to do a test a series of prototypes. Um, so this was when we were testing three connected environments uh, where water and clouds are shared across the environment um, and there's a desert uh, reservoir and uh, I think that was the plains. Look to the upper right and watch the clouds go from the far, that environment to the right onto the one in the middle, right? That is actually like rocket science right there. That, that is really hard to, apparently hard to achieve in software. And then we have our birds that actually like start off as fish and then fly out of the reservoir into the jungle. And they were the, that was the only time nice I was like, okay, you know, we're going to bring down the, the realism hammer, hammer here for a second. Uh, they were very contentious. Um, <laughs> um, but here you can just see an early prototype of the jungle environment um, where children are planting seeds with their hands and then... Um, uh, kind of interacting with the creatures and ch choosing to chop down certain trees. We kept that chopping gesture. Um, we also had these prototype pumps that were bike pumps that hooked up with sensors that would allow children to pump water out of the reservoir environment. We actually nixed those in the end for a couple of reasons, but one of the funny reasons was that the children would pump water no matter what. Like if there was a drought, they would pump water. If there was no water, they would pump water. Like they got so focused on the interaction itself that they didn't even weren't even paying attention to the, the context of what they were doing. Um, so, so then you know the other big thing we had to solve um, was how to get water to flow across the floor across I think like you know almost three thousand square foot of uh, interactive floor projection. Um, in Funky Forest, the fl water just flowed from one direction to the other. But with um, connected worlds, we wanted w children to be able to like loop the water back on itself, you know, send water almost from any direction to any direction. 
So this is just, this is kind of like a debug view of an early test of our water system, which was particle based. And here you can kind of see the water, you can even get the water to sort of feedback on itself and interfere with itself, um, which was, you know, quite interesting because you create these situations where you have these unexpected outcomes from your actions. And you're like, oh no, that's not what I meant to do. And then you have to kind of fix, move a log and to fix it. And then this was a really interesting part of the process for us. Um, Eric and the team at NYSI had built, um, had I think as part of this process had involved NYU's Games for Learning Institute to provide kind of critical testing and feedback all along the way. And one of the things they wanted to do is give us feedback for the kind of creatures that we were gonna have in connected worlds. So we provided them with a whole sample of different creatures that you know, were from previous projects and some that we had sketched out. And they presented them to children and then interviewed them to get their feedback. And it was really interesting. These were some of the, <laughs> the creatures we provided. Um, the, f the initial feedback was everyone loves the purple bird. Um, no one likes the pink guy with the, the horn. And we were like, oh, okay. You know, it's a little disappointing, but like, you know, that's kind of good to know. And then we started reading through the feedback from the children, like the, the literal feedback. And this is all the, f I think there was 15, 20 kids interviewed. This is the only feedback we got from the purple bird. And that was the summary on the bottom left. And then this one, the summary was, it was confusing and, f and, and a few said they didn't like it. But we got like 10 times the amount of feedback for this character that the kids didn't like. And, and the feedback's really interesting. They're like trying to figure out like why he has this horn, what, what he is, is he a good animal, is he a bad animal? And I think because it was so unfamiliar and unrecognizable, they were asking a lot more questions about it. And so this actually kind of led to a realization on our end, which is that you know we could go really weird. And the weirder we were and the kind of less recognizable the creature was as a creature from the natural world, the more children were gonna actually question what it was. Um, they were going to pay more attention to it, and they might pay attention to what it, what its appearance or disappearance signifies. Um, so that was sort of a that was a really, from our perspective, a really valuable part of this this process working with the NYU. <laughs> and it was funny because the summary, if we had just read the summary, we might have drawn you know different conclusions. But so we went about making a bunch of weird creatures. <laughs> We spent some time talking about how people learn and how do you know how they learn. Um, and uh, we, do ha we did have these evaluators from NYU working with us. And there's o it's a very tricky thing, as this suggests, to, to, to take a bunch of interviews and turn them into usable information. And, and you know, I think nine out of ten designers would have said, okay, let's nix the purple thing with the trumpet nose um, because it freaks people out. Um, and I think part of the team, and I say I had nothing to do with this, um, this kind of insight that this actually makes you pay attention to it um, is actually borne out by my experience at the garden. You know, so the weirder plants are the ones that people really are curious about, where the, the morphology suggests something about the, their function. So, um, you know, evaluation is a tricky thing. Trying to understand what people know and, and how they learn in the context of museums is really uh, is a, it's more of an art than a science. And these are just a few of the creatures. This one is called the Wongu. Um, and we sort of built the, 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 the kind of bigger creatures. We, start, we built relationships between the creatures and the plants. And so if you plant the level four plant, which is this rain plant uh, in the wetlands, uh, you can help clean the Wongu. And that's when the Wongu sort of appears. Um, so you know, we wanted to try and inter introduce these sort of creature plant relationships. Um, this guy is pretty small character called the stork jumper but he's one of my favorite because he just he goes up and down the stalks of these plants in the light plains and uh, if you try and touch him he'll jump and land on the next stalk over and then this is a grazer which is sort of, uh, sort of a pretty weird creature who lives in the mountain valley and eats the grass but if the grass in the neighboring two environments is in good condition he'll come over and like eat all the small plants. So he kind of goes from being a benign creature to sort of a little bit of um, a kind of a problematic creature when you're trying to nurture your environment. 
but he's very curious. So if you hold out your hand, instead of eating the grass, he'll c kind of pay attention to your hand, and you can kind of make them bow to you some, if you kind of wave your hand up and down. <laughs> and these guys in the, uh, are the rock rollers. That, uh, they're from the desert, but when they get hot, they roll from the desert over to the mountain valley and sit in the river, which blocks the river and causes it to flood. So you have to periodically keep an eye out for the rock rollers um, and shoo them with your hand back to the desert. So I, I, I think you know, there's this level of sort of detail of interaction, um, some of which I actually didn't, I never got, and some of them just kicked out of me. Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, other than just being like incredibly playful and thoughtful, and, and, and I think part of Theo's thing was we can do this, so let's do it, but it was always in service of, the, of trying to create a, it's a bizarre word to use in this in this context, but trying to create a sense of naturalism um, in the environment, that the environment is truly responsive, um, and that there are things that are happening both with your agency and outside of your agency, which ends up by creating, and I think most kids didn't really notice that, I'm sure they didn't, but it ends up by creating a much richer um, pedagogical experience. And then this is the dream catcher from the uh, light planes, uh, who's kind of very delicate and ethereal, and so all of, we kind of we made, we built the plant system up so that you have to plant small plants and then bigger and bigger, and you can't plant the biggest plants unless the rest of the environment's in good shape, and so that was sort of meant so that you couldn't just sort of jump to the most unusual plants and children have to invest time and energy into kind of building up an environment to sort of discover all the creatures. This is a bit more of a technical thing, but. Um, we just kind of started coming up with pretty interesting ways to quickly build out plants by using kind of computer vision to automatically generate meshes. Um, and these are just some early prototypes of that. And this is when what happens when you forget to initialize your variables. Um, I hate kind of when that happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so the final installation, this was, you know, just to give you a sense of the time, I think there was about kind of a year t for the prototyping and concept development and about another year and a half till from the start of development to the final installation. Um, that was included a little bit of a delay because uh, the building wasn't ready. But that once we got in there, this is what it actually looked like. And they very kindly hadn't turned the heating on yet in the building. So um, Nick and I were sitting in this little bunker that they made for us with space heaters where it was like about 40 degrees outside of the bunker, like programming with hard hats on, which I, you know, I never thought I'd have to do. Uh, it was quite fun. Um, and then once all the infrastructure was in there, this is what it would look like when we would turn off the projectors at night to go home. Um, and you know, we spent a few weeks on site there uh, calibrating the floor projection. Um, this is the computer vision system that's tracking the logs from above. So you can see uh, where we detect the logs and then testing uh, the match registration of the vision system to the projection. So let me ask you a few geeky questions, or you know, sort of technical, quasi-technical questions here. So um, most of the interaction that young people had with the wall, the visitors had with the wall was based on connects, is yeah. that right? And they were based on the first generation of connects. Right? We tried the later generations, they were too fussy. The, we had to, they had to develop an entirely different system to track th what was happening on the floor. Um, right? Is that tell me if I'm saying anything that's incorrect? No, that's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah so, and that there there were 16 um, uh, projectors, um, and how many computers? 16 p computers were there. Um, eight com eight Mac <laughs> Pros yeah. and 16 projectors. Yeah. So I mean, this was um, you know an incredibly elaborate system, um, and I think it may be the largest of its kind in the world. I've never heard of anything more elaborate. But anyway, um, so I just wanted to. This is this this sort of he's passing by the geekery you know pretty quickly which is great, um, but it was I just want to make sure that you understand a few things first the whole of science went out on a huge limb and and for that matter design and I O went out on a huge limb in order to undertake this we were doing things that had never been tried before um, and um, we'll talk about the aftermath which is very positive um, after we t finish this talk. Yeah, I should also add that, that for about a year and a half, I would say, I didn't know 
how we were going to do the log tracking on the floor. And I, we were in a building uh, that where a lot of people from MIT have like small startup companies and stuff. And I was pretty much like offering to buy anyone in the building a beer if they could help me figure out. Um, you know, I'd grab people and pull them aside, and these are like people who are doing stuff for the military and stuff. And like, you know, like, and they're like, well, maybe you could get one of those things that like sits on the bottom of a plane that scans like, you know, the topology of the country. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think we could do that. You know. But in the end, we, we came up with a, a retroreflective infrared uh, system where the logs, the fabric of the log is retroreflective. And we had three infrared cameras with uh, large, powerful IR lamps uh, co-located throughout the space. And that ended up tracking really well. And so, you know, you can see this, the logs look slightly silver to your eye, but to the camera, they look bright white. Um, and here you can see us just testing the registration. Um, and then time sourcing log material, uh, <laughs> log fabric. And then we have to do all the projection mapping on the walls because the walls of, walls, of course, weren't flat like this. They were curved. So that was a lot of fun too, uh, building our own kind of projection mapping system. Um, this is what a wall would look like if we didn't compensate for it. And then what this is what we actually have to kind of send to the projector to make it uh, look like this, so to look correct to your eye. And then because uh, the walls are curved, we've also got to make all our tracking work along a curved surface. Um, so here you can see lining up the two connect cameras that are looking down from above, combining them into a single image, um, and then unwarping them so that, you know, from the cameras, uh, from the system's perspective, it's thinking that you're moving along a straight wall. Um, yeah. So yeah, this was for us, for us, this was a very ambitious project and it was a dream project and we just said yes and we kind of figured we'd figure it out as we went along, but there was a series of very significant technical hurdles. Um, so again, Point of view of our class, I want to draw a line under that. Um, you know, there's, this was, um, I should mention, this was a, well, when all is said and done, a four or five million dollar project, right? Um, and that's not including the building. This is including, you know, just so there were a number of people who made very risky decisions, um, including me, uh, to to go ahead with this from a curatorial point of view. I'm not sure what we were thinking of. Uh, it was there were easier ways to do this, but we got kind of got caught up in the challenge. Um, and then there were funders who were really interested in doing this. So. Um, and then Theo and Emily were always incredibly just like right there. So, you know, and anyway, we'll talk about how it worked. And, and you'll see here that the, the chopping Fruit Ninja chopping gesture from that very first prototype made it through. Um, so that way, if your plant, if the plants had died from not getting enough water, you could chop down the dead plants. Um, we had to turn it off for live plants because our kids would come in like little plant terrorists and like just chop down everything and then run out like kind of cackling to themselves. Um, boys. Yeah, mainly yeah, mainly boys. <laughs> um, and then y this is just sort of testing all the interactions. So this was fairly complex. The fact that you could block a project something on the projection wall on the wall with a log on the floor, um, and you know the because those are two running on two separate computer systems, um, but the, they had to kind of act seamlessly together. And then finally, when it was all said and done, just kind of play testing across the whole space, making sure that the water routing was working. Um, you know, when the water goes into the wall, it, it adds water to the water table, and if you flood an area, you can actually pull water out of the wall uh, by sticking a log into it, and you, know, you can see the water on the wall slowly going down as you're pulling water out. So it gives the children kind of options to both put water in and pull water out of the system. Um, and then we did a lot of play testing with kids of different ages. Um, we did some testing with teenagers, which was our most kind of nervous moment, I think. Um, and it was really exciting to see like 15, 16 year olds like dramatically embracing kind of saving an ecosystem. You know, we thought they would be a little bit more blase about it. Um, and then checking children who are very small as well, making sure that our computer vision system is, is tracking them correctly. I want to look at that word blasé for a second, though I know it's a casual word. You know, so what's the point of making this so fanciful? What's the point of making it so beautiful? And what's the point of making it so um, uh, unexpected? 
Um, you know, we could have put birds that look like birds, and we could have put plants that look like plants, and we could have put water. Well, the water kind of looks like water. Um, and you know, I think the, the, we talked about this a little bit before. You know, empathy and sort of storytelling and and immersion and you know caring about um, caring about the topic is always one of the challenges of in, engaging people and thinking about science. So you know, we could have put penguins and 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 sort of made them more. Um, more representative, uh, but it, it, this kind of playful and empathetic quality, you sort of, you know, you, I think all of us had our favorite beasts um, and our favorite plants that you really wanted to see grow. And, and, and I know the young people felt that way as well. So, you know, in addition to sort of just the sheer fun of making things that, that's this beautiful, um, there, there really is a pedagogical point to it. And, and also, do you remember at this point, we were also sort of stress testing the system a little bit? and there was this desire from the kind of, I guess, the people who manage tickets and everything to get, be able to put as many children as possible in this experience. And we sort of kind of organically found this threshold which seemed to be 60 children. Under 60 children, like people would play and work well together, but there was this moment where I think we brought in like 60 kids and it was like kind of WWF rampage. Like they were tear pulling the logs, of, like actually ripping these very, very like robust logs, like ripping them apart. It, it was a kind of funny moment where, like I think the, the senior teams at NYSI had to see it happen, and then everyone was like, okay, we get, we'll limit it to like 40 or 50 kids at once. But here's just a little video of Connected Worlds, and uh, just to kind of show you the final thing. This goes back to that open play idea, which is there's no wrong way to use it. <laughs> um, so just before we end, maybe should I just show that we built a couple of companion pieces and one that we kind of finished fairly recently called The Living Library. And this is sort of like the encyclopedia of connected worlds uh, where you can go through and explore the different ecosystems and the creatures that live in it. Um, and it's done with a projection and a connect so you can interact with uh, the pages. So the pages themselves are blank, but when you turn the page, we have a camera that recognizes the page number that's actually printed on the page, and the rest of the content is then animated and projected on. So there's sort of both physical, uh, printed and digital, content uh, on each page. And this is sort of a way, we wanted to have something like this for older children and also for parents who are kind of standing around watching their children to sort of really dig into a bit more of the science um, and the concepts and the reasons why, um, and especially if children don't understand what this creature represents or why the, this creature has done something, they can go look it up. see the little delay as it kind of sees the new pages and loads all the content. And normally I kind of show a little bit of like how the, this is the connect tracking. Um, so uh, trying to detect your hand across a curved surface of the page is quite challenging. So we built a whole system for doing that. Um, 
And then this is the page recognition where you can actually see all the markers that it knows to exist and then what it thinks is the best match uh, by looking at features and trying to uh, match in the same way that kind of QR codes or uh, uh, markerless uh, QR markers work. This is a bit more of the, the technology behind it. Anyway, so that's, that's it from me. Um, before before I get started um, asking questions, did, did anything come up during the course of this that anybody here wants to ask? Yeah, please. Ah, sorry, please. Yeah, push it up. Push up. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, I was just wondering, specifically, because you're designing so much for younger individuals, what is it, um, in terms of the like goal of the project, understanding if people are like, t is it more focused on wondering if students are like, or like younger individuals are like learning things from the project, that they're working more hands-on, and that's more like a latent ability that they take like throughout their lives, like, or is there, or like, there is a pedagogical goal, but how do you feel like you can discover it or that it affects them over time? Um, so I, I think you know, when we were building the exhibit, I didn't really talk about this point, but we would run sessions with uh, children of different ages, and then we would kind of interview them informally afterwards and sort of ask, why do you think this was happening? You know, where, where was the water coming from? You know, do you, you know, do you, did you notice uh, kind of any sort of moments where like there was tension or kind of problems? And so they would talk about, you know, when the water dried up, they were having to kind of negotiate about, you know, who got to have the water from which environments. Um, and so, you know, I think originally our, our kind of goal was to sort of introduce systems thinking concepts in a very, intu very intuitive way, you know, very kind of visual way. And so, you know, getting the children to actually negotiate with each other and recognize ten points of tension was really, you know, I think internally, once we got to that connected worlds idea that it is, was our goal. And, you know, we, there has, we did a lot of kind of interviews after the fact um, and a lot of, I think, recent kind of testing to kind of evaluate that that was what was happening. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I've said before, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Um, students always ask really good questions. Uh, and this one gets to the, uh, the nub of a lot of the challenges in, in, in creating um, science learning experiences for anybody, uh, kids being a, a subset of anybody. Um, and uh, the designers um, go in with a, with a typically a pretty uh, high level goal, like we want people to engage with systems thinking. Um, but also, skilled people who work in museums have uh, other other um, things they're trying to integrate to the experience at the same time. So, uh, we wanted people to like it. We wanted people to say, "This is amazing." We wanted people to say, "I've never seen anything like this." We wanted people to say, "I got to come back." We wanted to see it, people to say, "I'll pay money for this." We want you know, there's all kinds of things we really wanted um, in addition to the pedagogical goal. And I think if you look at if you look at um, if you you know during the course of your life you look at types of experiences, you can see it along a continuum of sort of here's the pedagogical. Um, here's the pedagogical weight of this, and here's the sort of I like it weight of it. And you'll see things that move back and forth across that continuum. Um, and my, my colleague used to refer to it as the, the continuum between the steak and the sizzle. Um, and uh, this, this particular thing, I, would, I think it's fair to say we're all, we're all friends in this room, um, that pedagogically there are probably relatively few people who could say back to us what we wanted them to say back to us as a result. You know, this is about systems thinking, it's about the stocks and flows, it's about, um, I would say there's a negligible number of people who are under the age of me um, who, would, um, who could say that back to us in any literal way. Typically when we ask people what this is about, they would say it's about um, environments, they'd say it's about water, um, some people would say, well, you can use only a certain amount of water. 
before the before the environment um, before you deprive other people. Some one of our goals was collaboration. So if you took too much water, then another environment wouldn't survive. So there was just by the way, you didn't mention this is a closed end amount of water. So there's not there's not an infinite supply of water. So you had to sort of collaborate. If 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 your goal was to make it a steady state and a healthy environment, you had to collaborate and share the water, not just water the hell out of your uh, biome. Um, and um, and then it also functions in at least two modes. One is what we call free play, which is just open the door and let people come in with a little bit of instruction. The second is school groups. So when school groups came in, they had more preparation. And so they would learn some of the sort of vocabulary-based ideas. Um, and I've mentioned to you before that I'm not really sure that being able to say the words back is really the best indicator of learning. So I think you put your finger right on it. There's a sort of affective uh, goal in this as well as, uh, you know, hands, sort of, I can control things. Um, that's another thing we heard a lot. Kids really love the idea that they can control so much in that environment. Uh, it was just, you know, I don't get to control much in my life. Um, so, um, so, you know, th there is a bunch of affective things, you know, putting affective at the other end of the scale, cognitive, are you familiar with that term, sort of feeling-based stuff as opposed to knowledge-based stuff, but coarsely? So, um, and I should just say finally, that this is an amazing balance between those two. I think there's a huge amount of richness intellectually as well as amazing fun, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, Eric, I'm sorry. Um, can I push you a little bit? <laughs> oh, sorry. On I'll the just walk right out. <laughs> I have won't tolerate them. No, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I have two questions. Yes, one please. about this term interaction. Yes. One about the term attention. Yes. Um, so that's I have two questions. So that my first question will do with this, and the second question. I don't think to I'm going to like this question. You know, I'm from the history department, and so this is how we <laughs> so. a question. So first question is, you know, actually I felt a great deal of unease watching this, mm -hmm. simply because I felt like a lot of these young children maybe will never catch a real bug in real life. I mean, we've lived in New York and lots of cockroaches and stuff, but... Wow, it's not that bad. <laughs> <My apartment was laughs> we right. have bugs. But so basically the question, it's so a sort of philosophical question about what the point of this exercise is, okay. or the, this installation, if in fact you're competing for people's attention, for the attention of small children and providing an experience that entertains them and makes them feel like they have more control, and they like that. But to be honest, anyone who's had any experience planting real things knows that there's a lot of tedious, boring, back and forth trial and error involved. And I wonder if providing environments or experiences that gives children a sense that, well, this is this is easy. You just cut down the thing with your, your ninja cut. When in fact, what you have to do is sharpen real tools and drag them here and there, and it's, you're tired afterwards. Right, so that's one thing. Um, my second can, I answer, can I answer that one before before you ask your other question? Sure, sure. Probably going to be a hard one. For you. Um, well, question no, just be hard. I, th I think very intentionally we, we weren't trying to create a real simulator of a real world. I mean, I think especially the fact that we kind of went more fantastical and less realistic was part of that. Um, but the big reason was we wanted to actually kind of create something that was artificial, where we could accelerate the time scale that children were working in, and we could accelerate the the kind of the make the feedback more dramatic um, for those reasons where if you were to really plant a seed in the ground you would be waiting you know a month maybe a little bit less depending on the plant um, we were like very intentionally not trying to create like a nature simulator and not really trying to compete with nature I think we are trying to actually just really impart this idea that children's actions have consequences and solving local problems like my environment doesn't have enough water, runs into a tension of, well, I might have solved this local problem, but uh, unintentionally, I might have actually contributed to s a another problem somewhere else. And so sort of bringing all these things artificially closer together in a kind of essentially li like a kind of a simulator type experience was sort of one of the reasons why I think we went down this path. But, um, you know, both yeah, I definitely didn't want to be trying to tell kids they should be inside in our simulator and not getting their hands dirty. And um, we know on our end, we're very inspired by nature. And so we wanted to sort of use nature as um, kind of inspiration for kind of drawing people into this uh, 
experience based around systems thinking concepts? Yeah, I mean, I have I have a lot of the same questions you have. Is probably the place I should start um, in terms of my work in, in public engagement in science. Um, and one of the and um, the there is uh, an intrinsic tension between um, what we know, re what it takes to re to attain mastery. Um, and what it takes to get people across a threshold so they even want to try to attain mastery. And um, in science museums, we typically are trying to get people across that threshold. So we're not, we, we don't have enough time with people in science museums to try to, and for the most part, um, for the bulk of our visitors to help them attain mastery. And I think it's a really, it's a critical question, how do they, and what are the resources for doing that? Um, we create a lot of things that are intended to ignite curiosity, to make people interested in things. Also, um, I think that there is a, um, going back to the rest of our class, uh, there's, there's something uh, to be said in the arts and in performance for the fact that none of this is creating a, a, a real situation, that they're all simulations. So we had a lot of discussion about theater um, and, and the simulation and, and the, the heightening of sensation in theater um, doesn't prepare you for the way life unfolds, necessarily. Eric, I would, I yeah. would push back against sure. that and say there's something very particular about the visual, the digital simulacra that you don't see in, say, theater. Like, if you see a body fall to the ground, you, you see gravity and its effects working in real time in space, whereas that's not necessarily No, you definitely here. have to take for, you have to take as part of what's going on here is that this is a digi digital representation. So, and for some people, and this is a generational thing, for some people that's, um, that, that represents a, a, a simulation of reality, and for some people it represents its own version of reality. And I think we have to accept, uh, for a lot of people, um, it's, it's a distinct experience. I don't, I don't have any sense that people confuse uh, what happens in connected world with what happens in nature, and that's part of the reason we wanted to be more fanciful. We didn't want to engender that confusion. Um, so, and I think, um, I know that young people are not confused about what is happening in a computer. I mean, there's been a lot of research about this, about what's happening, we all have our own speculations, but there's been a lot of research that kids know what happens in a video game is in a video game. What happens when their parents ask them to clean up their room is what happens when their parents ask them to clean up their room. So there's no, right? Everybody in the difference between a video game, you're, you know, <laughs> um, and um, so, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about engendering that confusion, and I do think you have to accept that, that digital vocabulary is a, gender, is, is a generational uh, issue. Um, I I I like it, but I see the drawbacks, and I understand your point. But so we can have this discussion ongoing. Can I ask the hard hard question? I thought you did. <laughs> no, no, no. This is going to be a hard question, and okay. um, I'm very sorry that perhaps you're bearing the brunt of this, but um, <laughs> we're we're know, good, man. This, <laughs> this is fine. Do this so. me, but it did it did strike me that um, your curatorial or your design team, your design team, to me. The, the larger question is basically why, why is the arts and design field so white? Mm. There was a New York Times article about why curators are overwhelmingly white. Mm. Uh, I can't answer that. I, I mean, I, I just simply can't answer it. There's, it's, it uh, they, this society has striated things in ways that are going to take generations to un unfold, and, and we're not heading in the right direction. It's the simplest thing I can say. Is this simply a... I hope this is a wrong impression, but is this? Oh no, it's no? the right impression. Okay. The museum yeah. field in general yes. is quite white. Yeah, so I don't think there's any point. And it's a discuss subject of discussion in the museum field all the time. Part of the reason in the museum field is that economically we're not really in a great position to offer people advancement. So it's um, it's it's not you know you have to sort of be have reason. I, I, it's a really complicated question, and and, and um, I, I the best thing I can say is I have n I can't answer it. Sorry, I'd like to. Um, yeah, please, here. I was just curious. Um, I mean, maybe this is just partly how uh, the whole project came together, but like this whole experience within the context of a museum, like, like I guess maybe more of a question for you, like why does design IO work specifically within a museum? Just because it, I, it seems like it would there would be a lot of applications for like an experience like this outside of the museum space. So um, maybe if you could speak to that and also how like placing that within the context of a science museum affected um, the experience that you've created. That's, that's, I mean, that's a pretty interesting question for us because I think we sort of unintentionally sort of stumbled into the museum sphere um, before working with the New York Hall of Science 
Emily and I had mainly been just sort of coming up with weird ideas for festivals. Um, we'd done a few other uh, projects. We did a project in San Francisco for the an arts commission for Market Street, and that was that went on at night. Um, and we were pretty much just trying to come up with crazy ideas and get them, sort of make them and kind of get them in front of people. And a lot of that happened more in the festival context. So f with children's festivals and arts festivals where we would show something for two to six weeks. Um, and I think the what we realized is that, um, I think what NICE I realized is they, that museums sort of as a whole were going through this transformation period where the approach of designing exhibits was kind of this very traditional sort of Charles and Rames exhibits that you know everything was physical, uh, there wasn't a lot of cutting edge technology and sort of suddenly there was almost this sort of realization of like how much different the museum experience could be. And I think, you know, NYSI in some ways like kind of recognized, was rec had probably recognized that for a while but then almost sort of just went you know, like we never thought they were going to let us make this project, <laughs> to be honest. And we kind of were like a little shocked that they, they sort of said yes to everything that they did. Um, but now I think we've seen like so many other museums around the U.S. sort of scrambling to catch up. And uh, you know, a big part of it is funding probably and money because you know you can't do a project like Connected Worlds for a two-week festival. It's just not possible. But we do projects that are really a wide variety of budgets because we want to get the work we're doing is in front of the widest possible audience. Um, and you know, not just you know, people who are living in the kind of cities like New York and San Francisco. Um, science museums ha have, uh, are sometimes, sometimes que it was questioned for a long time whether science museum is the right word. Um, uh, early in my talks, we put up a definition of museums, and for the most part, museums are seen as places that have heritage that to display or uh, objects to display, and and that's not what science museums typically do. Um, and sometimes they're called science technology centers um, as a result. I should mention at the same time that we were doing this, virtually at the same time, we were building uh, an ex exhibit uh, that I showed last on Design Lab, but that had virtually no technology embodied in it at all. So we were trying all kinds of, it also had no exhibit embodied, I mean it was just a space. So, uh, it was a maker space. So we were trying everything at that point, and that really is down to a woman who came from outside the field, who was the CEO, who was willing to listen to Weird, weird ideas. So I was so I was similarly surprised. She kept on saying yes. A mic is coming. Um, I was wondering about the technical decisions you have to make. So why did you choose a connect over um, some of the other options? Um, so we, we looked at a whole range of tools for both the floor interaction and the wall interaction. Um, the Connect, uh, even though it was the very first version of the Connect, had some advantages over the newer device. Um, it's a completely different the newer device had already come out, so we actually have to scramble to find enough of the old devices, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm regularly on eBay, like, buying up lots of old uh, Connects. Um, but the the Connect V1, like from a technical perspective, it could actually give you depth data from a much larger range of distance. You can push it um, up to 14 meters, whereas the V2 is kind of only comfortable going up to six or seven meters. Um, and the noise, the when the V2 gets data, it's more accurate, but it's less reliable at giving you data back. Um, and so w we did a whole bunch of tests, but the V1 is like you get a kind of uglier silhouette of a person, but it's it gives it to you all the time, whereas the V2 was is really designed to be used at a much closer range. Um, and then there's all these other options, but you know, pretty much the Microsoft and the Kinect put like the 3D imaging uh, industry out of business for a short period of time because what they were what they delivered for 150 bucks was like the equivalent of a $5,000 industrial camera. Um, so, you know, it really, it looks cheap, but it's still a very cutting edge product. Um, and now Apple's figured out how to put it into an iPhone, um, which is crazy. I have yes, a quick please. question. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say that is a truly beautiful interaction. 
Interactive, and I hope it's still up because I would like to visit. It is. There someday. It's the, okay. I, I should, yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Um, so I've worked with museums in hiring people like you to do electronic interactives. I've also worked for a firm like yours. Um, all my projects were much smaller, but I have to say that for every project I worked on, um, at the end of it, people in your position felt that they hadn't really made money. They would count up the hours and say it's less than minimum wage or whatever. And oh man, not another hard question. It was sadness <laughs> for me, honestly, and I wondered if you made money and if you would would speak to that. Um, you know, I think, so <laughs> at the time, this was easily the biggest budget project we'd ever worked on. And, um, you know, we thought we would be driving Lamborghinis afterwards and, you know, living living this good life. Uh, as it turned out, you know, like it, it went on for a lot longer and we, it, it was a passion project for us. So we put in a lot of kind of extra hours into the project. And um, I think, you know, in retrospect, we probably charged like a quarter of what most firms that are maybe a little bigger would have charged, maybe even less than that. But at the same time, you know, I think they pretty much let us do our dream project. Um, so now, you know, I think after every project we do, we always end up upping our rate because we th always seem to be sort of underselling, underselling ourselves. Um, and but we're also a small team, so there's only four of us. So we were able to be, we were able to do projects that other firms turn down and still sort of do okay at the end of the day. And um, it means that we have to move a little slower and we can't take on as many projects. And we're much more picky about the projects we do take on. Um, and you know, talking about the museum question earlier about why we do stuff with museums is because really the other avenue that a lot of firms like ours goes down is sort of doing stuff for marketing or advertising, and that the story becomes so much more about what the company's you know message is, what is the you know the return on investment that they want to get, and it's for us we're not really interested in that. We're just basically trying to find people to pay us to make projects we want to make. <laughs> So you know we ha we have to be a little bit more picky and a bit more and move a little slower as a result. Yeah, I mean that's just kind of a self-deprecating way of putting it. I mean the the um, the, um, the 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 work that um, Design IO did was extraordinary. It was, um, I think it was as far as I could tell, most of their life. Though you were doing other projects at the same time, but um, and their commitment to it was just sort of unending. Um, so. Um, I'm, you know, I hope you didn't lose money. Um, and I just wanted to address the, is it still up? It is definitely still up. One of the amazing things about one of the reasons we were interested in doing this kind of exhibition, it was, it was an experiment for us and for the science museum field, um, which is to say the big problem at science museums, the, like the Exploratorium or the Lawrence Hall of Science, is everything breaks. Uh, you heard, you heard um, him talk, uh, Theo talk about the stress testing that uh, older people put on um, those those bolsters that we had, well, just multiply that times the six, seven hundred exhibitions at the Exploratorium, um, and very complicated engineering. They're not little bolsters, and so their their life is about fixing exhibitions, uh, and very not that not as much as they would like about making exhibitions. This there is nothing to touch. Uh, people don't touch stuff. Uh, it's a, it's a disembodied, which I think is actually kind of weird from a pedagogical point of view. I think actually to pay things point, I think that's probably more a challenge pedagogically than the digital quality of it. It's the lack of touch involved. And that was one of the things we talked about early on, whether you could touch the walls, um, because there is a real difference um, in how people learn when there's no touch in, embedded in it. But the advantage to that is nothing breaks. Um, so the exhibition I, I checked in re uh, recently, the exhibition is still running. Um, and it's super popular and people love it um, and people are buying tickets for it. Um, and we're building sort of more pedagogical experiences around it. Um, and there's, there's two, two, there's one thing about that that I, that another thing that makes this exhibition special, um, which is that after we opened, we would show up in the room sometimes and see a new creature we had never seen. And it wasn't until that happened that I realized that they kept their pipeline into the systems and kept on sort of putting new behaviors into these into these creatures and new a new flower a new beast. Um, so they would surprise us every once in a while with something new. I don't know. You probably guys are probably off that by now. Definitely, but no, that was just the creatures in the world evolving. Uh, yeah. Oh, I 
see okay. But the only other thing we didn't mention is that all the parameters, the rules that govern connected worlds, like how much water, the, how the speed plants grow, even the time of interaction, everything was is actually can be controlled remotely uh, by the staff at NiSci, so they can and they can give those different sort of session names, so they can create scenarios where drought is extremely likely or where you know rainstorms and flooding might be more likely and and kind of build essentially kind of build playlists or experiences designed to sort of test particular age groups um, or kind of you know or teach particular lessons so the system as a whole is actually script can be scripted by the staff at NiSci and uh, they keep asking for more and more controls um, which now and now you can cut down alive trees too <laughs> Yeah, please. Um, yeah, that was that was fantastic. That was really amazing. Um, it was also really inspiring to me. One thing that I thought was super interesting is the the feedback loop, like how you really you you simulated nature, but you made it so much quicker, and it was so you could so easily see the effect that whatever your actions had. Um, I thought that was really am amazing, and I'm wondering if this becomes a bigger project or stuff like this becomes more permeated throughout the museum culture, especially with younger generations, I guess socially, will that have an effect on their ability to, s to foresee what might happen if their actions were to take place? Um, actually, I mean, right now, we're, I probably shouldn't say this, but we're working on, we've been talking with multiple people about um, finding ways to uh, integrate the NASA data that exists, the, the mo NASA models that exist, that will sh kind of simulate um, glacial melt and how the glacial melt in the Arctic and Antarctic region will affect sea level rise. Um, and we're trying to find a, a, ni a nice way to frame this. In a nice not playful way to frame that. Yeah, not a super depressing way to be like, oh, your home in Florida is gonna be disappear <laughs> you know, in this number of years. But- you Should uh, model it on Mar-a-Lago and just so- Yeah, <laughs> that part, maybe that just that part. Um, but you know the the challenge I think there and with a lot of this stuff is like how do you how do you put this in front of people, and still make them feel like they have some sort of control over the outcome because sort of just being like hey if we don't do anything, you know at worst all this terrible stuff's going to happen and you know at best you know or like at best all this terrible stuff's going to happen and at worst you know it it could be even more depressing, so th that is honestly a really tough challenge in designing experiences ar you, when you're bringing in science, especially science related to climate change, and there isn't a great answer for that. <laughs> so one of the, this relates to something that was touched on in a couple of comments also, um, which is that increasingly, uh, for, for, for a decade or so, uh, people in all kinds of contexts have been looking, to wa ways, looking for ways to make what they're doing to have the attractive attributes of a game um, with controllable parameters, competition, um, and we had actually had a game design person working with us on this, uh, and I think at this point there probably is a game that's in, in evolution about this. You want to talk about that for a second, and then we'll we'll get to your question. Um, well, at the moment we're working with the New York Hall of Science on a okay. video game. Um, that the goal is, it's I think they're just trying to give us the most difficult problems, but it's to teach computational thinking within the realm of environmental science. So I had this colleague, Steve Uzo, who's drawn to the most difficult topics, uh, and I've worked with him for years, so this is perfect. But uh, our goal, I don't know if it, people are familiar with, you know, everyone right now is like, how do we get everyone to be programmers, essentially? That's sort of, you know, engineers, scientists, programmers. Um, and if you look at sort of the tools that children are being presented with for teaching programming, they all look very similar. There's, you know, there's a one called Scratch, and there's like turtle-based games, and they're all very, very similar. And um, you know, they're they're kind of other ways to kind of think about code. And what we were thinking with this project was like, how do we just get people to think computationally, without necessarily programming, like having to deal with syntax? Just you know, one of the big things I ran into when I was learning how to code was just how do you take a problem and break it down into a series of bite-sized sub-problems and then like, you know, even that idea of sort of abstracting out what you're trying to do into a series of solvable problems is quite difficult. So we're trying to build a game where children are effectively kind of thinking computationally to solve the puzzle, you know, get to the objective, 
but in a way where later on, if they ever approach programming, there is something about inherent with with what we with the game that they played that they're like, oh, this feels familiar to me for some reason. Like I feel comfortable around this. And so it's not necessarily to give them an interface where they're programming in order to solve a game, but just to introduce the concepts, like the kind of key concepts in a non-syntax related way to children. And it, it could n to totally not work, but I think it would be an interesting idea because then they're only overcoming one hurdle when they're dealing with syntax as opposed to trying to deal with the syntax of programming and learning how to actually think from a kind of computational standpoint. Well, and it also addresses the sort of social question, which is, 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 there, is there a way to in, in empower people to think about the components of large, complex social problems and address them? It's not just computational thinking, it's, it's behavior in the world. Yeah, please. Children engage the game outside of the space itself, like later. So, so the game that we're working on now is also trying to thread that needle as well, <laughs> which is, um, you know, it's part of it is meant to be something that children can leave connected worlds and kind of pick up on some of the themes. Um, and we're at the same time, we're also trying to do the computational thinking part. Um, but that is the goal is to sort of like allow children to explore this outside of the museum environment. So one last question. I think we're nearing the end of our class time or our lecture time. Okay, well, th if there isn't, I think it just remains to thank Theo for spending the time with us, and um, thanks. Thank you very much, everyone.